If this term is not here, this simply says the plot of log of the cost and log of the capacity. So in this case, equation A is for capacity. Okay. I'm using these different notation because that's just how it's focused on the So if a, log, a plot of log of cost and log of capacity is a straight line, if you forget this term, right? Now, as I told you, if a, it's never going to be linear over a very big range. So either you can say, okay, you're going to keep changing K1 and K2, depending upon the capacity. Or you say, you know what, I'm just going to try for that. So the book and the data is available in literature actually is used through fitting a quadratic. So you have three parameters, K1, K2, and K3. So any type of equipment you want, you can find out K1, K2, K3 for that, either in Appendix A in the book, and certainly if you're working in industry, the industry will have a database that you can use. Okay, so that's how you use to figure out the cost of the equipment at base condition. So you already know the capacity, you figure out K1, K2, and K3 for the table. Really, it's quite straightforward. Any questions? These are some of the tables. I kind of copied the tables. Uh, yeah, there's really not much for me to say, except you have different equipment type. Within this equipment type, there are different options. And then you have K1, K2, K3 for those. And then, of course, you have to make sure that you use the correct units. You have to use the capacity in the correct units. And then there are also some ranges. If, if your data is outside this range, then of course you can't use that correlation. But sometimes you have no choice. Your data is outside the correlation and you don't have any other correlation. The best you can do then is to use the correlation. But you should just be careful with these correlations. Because you've already extrapolated them. There's some more data. All right, any questions so far? So by now everybody understands how to calculate the cost of the equipment at base conditions, CP naught. How? How do you do that? Look at the appendix. What do you look for? Okay. K1, K2, K3. So you need to know what type of equipment you're dealing with. You look at that type of, that name of the equipment, but then more details, because there are many types of heat exchanger. So if you first go to heat exchanger, then you see what type yours is. And you look at K1, K2, K3, you already know the capacity, apply that equation, or the formula actually, and you get your answer for cost, CP naught. Right, so pretty clear? All right. So now, of course, what we really want is not, so we already know CP naught. But we don't really just want CP naught. What do you want? You want the bare module cost, right? Why do you want the bare module cost and not just CP naught? Total cost. Because that's the real expenditure, right? You want to figure out, we're trying to cost the plant. You're trying to figure out how much money do you have to spend. Like equipment just sitting in your garage is not going to do you any good, right? You want the plant operational. So you want to, of course, figure out the bare module cost. And the way to figure out the bare module cost is using this equation, where CP0, so we already talked about that CB, CBM is proportional to CP0. We already said that earlier, right? In the previous slide, I had a bunch of alpha values. Here, it has been more formalized that this proportionality constant actually has, four, is, has this form, P1 plus B2 FMFP. But BM, P1 and B2, again, are constants for the equipment. So again, you can find that from the tables. FM is what is called material factor. FP is called what is called pressure factor. Okay? So at base conditions, which means room temperature, uh, uh, the standard pressure, and the material of construction is carbon steel. FM is 1 and FP is 1. So if FM is 1, FP is 1, CBM is simply CP0 times B1 plus B2. So what do you think is the rough value of B1 plus B2? 4. 4. We already talked about that, right? I just say, I'm just asking the same question in a slightly different way. So we know B1 and B2 totes plus B2 will be roughly around 3 to 4. FN and FP could be very significantly, under base conditions, they're going to be one. They could be considerably higher depending upon uh, what sort of conditions you're looking at. If you're working at very high temperature, FN could be high, you look at that. If you're working with very high pressures or at full vacuum, FP could be high. Okay? All right, any questions? Okay, so let's now figure out how do you find out all these parameters. 
And let's keep track of how many parameters. So to figure out CP0, how many parameters do we need? Three, K1, K2, K3. So three of those, that B1 and B2. So B1 and B2 is like, this is the table, okay? So again, there's a table that will give you B1 and B2. So that's three plus two, five. So five, and then we still have to figure out FM and FP. Alright, so now let's figure out how do we get FM and FP. So this is, a, this is a, a graph of how to get FP for pressure vessels. As I was telling you, in pressure vessels, as the pressure goes high, you can see the FP can become extremely high. Okay? And that is why you can see that you try to separate out the effect of pressure from everything else. Uh, so, so the way to find out FP for pressure vessels is you can use this picture, or you can use these equ this equation. This equation and this will basically give you the same results. Okay, so you look at the pressure, and you look at uh, so in this equation, FP. Uh, so T minimum. This actually all these terms are described in the next slide. T minimum is the minimum thickness that pressure vessels can have. And that value is 0 0.00315 meters. So this is the minimum thickness. Okay, so that's what T minimum is in the previous line. And P, of course, the pressure, what is bar G? What is bar G? Bar gauge, which means pressure with reference to bar, right? So what is one atmosphere on the bar, bar G scale? One atmosphere is almost one bar. So what is bar gauge? Okay. Almost zero, right? Okay, yeah. So, uh, okay, so, so that's P in the, in the bar G. And P here again is the pressure, D is the diameter. CA is what is called corrosion allowance. So you always add an extra term to account for corrosion allowance. P is the pressure, T minimum is the minimum thickness, I already told you. So you can use this equation or this graph to figure out the pressure factor for the pressure vessels. Okay, now if you don't have a pressure vessel, if you have some other equipment, then you use this equation to figure out the pressure factor. So if you're getting bored, it's understandable. It's understandable if you get bored, but it's also important you realize how important costing is. Yeah. Wait, so what, when do we use this equation? I'm sorry. So pressure factors. Again, I, I think I will, I will keep reminding you so that you, keep, you don't forget what, what we're doing here. We're trying to figure out the bare module cost of an equipment. To figure out that, we first need CP0. That requires K1, K2, K3, right? OK. So let's separate this out. Then we need the extra factor, the proportionality constant. The proportionality constant we split into two parts. Right? One is just the actual equipment. The second term takes into account material of construction and pressure. So the proportionally constant is B1 plus B2 FM FP. Okay? So B1 and B2 we figure out from tables. Yeah. So why is the material of construction for the equipment encapsulated than the equipment cost? Why is it not in the equipment? No, it's sort of in there. But there's an extra effect depending upon it is there, that's why that FM is there. But you can ask, one question you can ask me is why is FM and FP in that multiplicative relationship? I mean, clearly the cost of the equipment will depend on the pressure, will depend upon the material of construction. That's why there is a correlation there. But the way it's calculated is, you first calculate with the base conditions, and then you take into account the extra effect of pressure and material. It's just done in this way. But eventually, of course, it does depend. Yeah. So you're buying a heat exchanger then you assume it's made out of blood before you factor for its material. Like you assume it's made out of... Well, it, you will force it, you it is made up of carbon steel, you will cost it, and then you will take into account the fact it is not carbon steel through this material effect. Okay. Again, this is just how it is done. So you, there's no... I suppose this is a way of very clearly showing what percentage of the cost can be allocated to what aspect. That's just one rational I can think of. Yeah. What does the cost of equipment consist of other than the material? Hmm? The cost of equipment itself. Other what is the cost of the equipment in addition to the material in the equipment? Yes. 
Well, the company that made the equipment had its own capital costs, had its own operation costs, right? I, I'm not sure I understand the question completely. Yeah, the cost of your equipment itself. I mean, when somebody is selling you the equipment. Yes. So that person who's selling you the equipment is running his own company. So he has his own capital cost that was incurred to set up the plant to make the equipment. His own labor costs, his own operational costs. So all those are going in, and he's doing some sort of a costing analysis to figure out at what cost he should sell the equipment. But the material will be a very small fraction of that. The engineering costs, right? It's just like saying when you buy medicine, what is the actual cost of the chemical when you buy a $100 medicine? Like the EpiPen, you're talking about EpiPen, right? EpiPen is selling for, I don't know, $300, $600. What is the actual cost of that? About a dollar. Uh, sorry? About a dollar. It's a little bit more than that, it's less than $10. So same thing with equipment. Equipment, just the material, if you look, just look at the iron. If you're gonna sell this to a, what is that called, and you throw something away and you just scrap it. Sell it, scrap it, you get a fraction of the cost, right? So the material, just, just the material is really the most important cost. All right, so, so, okay, so let's go back. K1, K2, K3. And I'm repeating this many, many times because I understand that this is something, for lack of a word, not very exciting. So I have to repeat myself many times for it to go into your brain. But remember this, it's important. So sometimes you have to do stuff that is not very exciting. Okay, so to figure out CP, what do we need? K1, K2, K3. That's just the cost of the equipment at base conditions. Then we have correction factor, or the, and that is how do we how do we express that? P1 plus P2 FMFP, and we are doing this to very clearly point out what is the effect of pressure, what is the effect of material of construction. Okay, so that means we have to first figure out P1 and P2, and we figured that on tables. We are still left with FMFP, FP for pressure vessels. How do we get that from that picture or the equation that is below the picture for other equipments? You use this equation, log of Fp is C1 plus C2 log P plus C3 log P squared. Okay? So for pressure factor, you have three more constants. Okay? So again, you look at the table, you look at these, and you, you figure it out. Now for some equipment, Fp is always one. Yeah? So, I'm sorry, what do you mean by other equipment? So that's where you just have to look at the list. Okay. You go to the table, see what lists, if the, if the equipment is there, just use it. If not, you have to figure out why is it not there, look for other tables. Like for instance, I'm gonna give you as much example as possible. So you can see that here, some equipments are unaffected by pressure, like the trays in a distillation column. You will not find any FP for trays, because what, irrespective of the pressure that the distillation column is operating, the pressure difference across the plates is minuscule. So the high pressure doesn't affect anything. And therefore, the FP for the actual plates in a displacement column is really just one. Similarly, other equipment such as compressors do not have pressure corrections because some, for some equipment it's just not available, so you don't have that. But anyway, so as I said, you try to look around, and that's really what costing eventually boils down to. A lot of it is just looking around to see if we can find the data. Okay. Nobody's going to give you all the data put together into one place. The book does try to, tries to do a good job. So okay, so now let's go back. K1, K2, K3 for CP, then B1, B2. Then to get FP, you will need three more constants, C1, C2, C3, okay? <coughs> all right, so here's, here are some examples. Again, different equipment type. We have C1, C2, and C3. Now if C1, C2, C3 are all zeros, what does it mean for FP? One. FP is one. Right? Which basically is really what I also said in the previous slide. Compressors, we don't have that, but if you remember in the previous slide, I said it because there is no data, not because there will be no effect of pressure, there's just no data. So you have no choice but to just assume that to be basically one. Okay, all right. Okay, so now what's the last thing left? Material of construction, right? Because CP, CP naught, we get it from K1, K2, K3, and B1 and B2. So B1 plus B2, FMFP is the correction factor or the extra factor. B1 and B2 we get from tables. FP we basically get from that equation which involves C1, C2, C3. Okay? 
The legs. Everybody's okay so far? Okay. Again, nothing conceptual here, but it's important in your, your mind to have an understanding of what each term is doing and how where we're going to get all this information from. Okay? So these are not really fundamental equations, but nonetheless, it's important for you to actually just know it in your mind of how costing is done. Because that's the only way to really have some understanding of it or some appreciation for it. So material of construction could be very, very critical. So here, there's a bunch of chemicals that are listed. And then the most common materials that are, uh, that are available in chemical industry. And A means acceptable. So if you look at aquaregia, you can see nothing is acceptable in there. The titanium and TFE. TFE is some sort of a polymer, I think. Uh, that with tetrafluoroethylene, yeah. So that's a, that's a very good polymer for a bunch of these things. Uh, if you look at another interesting thing is nitric acid. So let's say if there's a nitric acid. Or even hydrofluoric acid. Not, a lot of things are not acceptable. So you have to basically look at the chemicals that you're dealing with and figure out in what materials you can use. You want to use carbon steel as much as possible, except you can think a lot of chemicals, carbon steel is not acceptable. Because carbon steel is typically the cheapest one. And so if there was carbon steel was used, then your FM will be one. If carbon steel is not used, you have to figure out FM or whatever material you're looking at. Now the correction factor FM will not depend just on the material. What else will it depend on? It also depend on the equipment. Okay, so basically as always, you have some way of uh, figuring out those parameters. So everything else we already talked about how to get it. The material factor in that are given again in appendix A of the book in tables A3 to A3, A3 <coughs> and in figures A18 to A19. So you can see I've, tr I've tried to give you all the information for casting right on these slides. So hopefully it's not going to be too difficult. So this is how you get the material factors. You get the equipment description. You get the material of construction. And then based on that, you find out identification number. Okay? Once you know your identification number, you go to this graph, I suppose. And then you read your identification number and you read your material factor. Just a way of presenting data. Okay? And as some of you are saying, now this all is in the computer, so you can actually directly use it on the computer. All of you with the book come came to CD, which actually has a software called CapCost. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later. Anyway, that's how you get your so this is a summary of everything you've talked about so far. To figure out the bare module cost, you first need CP naught. CP naught is the cost of the equipment. What does the zero mean? Base condition. So to figure that out, you need K1, K2, K3. To get that, you can get this. To figure out the bare module cost, you have to multiply this by B1 plus B2 FMFT. So you have to figure out B1 and B2. B1 and B2 you get from table. FP you can get from this equation. And FM, you identify the identification number. And then you look at that graph to figure out FM. And that's pretty much it. OK? So far, so good? OK. Yeah? Could you go back to the last slide? Sure. Yeah. Oh, you want to copy it? I will put all the slides online. Oh, okay. Yeah. What is A in the first equation again? Capacity. OK. A is capacity. And B1 is the, the uh, direct equipment cost? So B1 and B2, these are these are extra factors that you have to include to calculate the bare module cost. Right. P is the pressure in bar, bars, G usually. <coughs> and the units of capacity, you have to look at A is the capacity in whatever units. Because units will change depending on the equipment, right? Like for heat exchanger, what do you think will be the capacity? Units of capacity. Area, very good, right? So yeah, of course, it will vary from uh, equipment to equipment for a ball, for a reactor, for a vessel, it will be the cube. And... All right, so this is how you do it for most of the equipment. But then